Hello, everyone, and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists here to answer your gardening questions. Today is a special Halloween episode, so I'm here as a bee uh, to uh, host the show today. My name is Candace Hart. I'm a State Master Gardener Specialist for University of Illinois Extension, and I'm based here in Central Illinois. And I like to answer questions about any flowering plants, annuals, perennials, cut flowers, and then just kind of general home horticulture landscape stuff. So if you have questions today, feel free to start adding them into the chat box and we're going to address those. Our specific topic today are insects in particular. We have a great guest with us. So if you have insect questions in particular, definitely get those in today, but we're happy to answer anything. So uh, I do want to introduce, though, our other horticulturists who are here with us every week. So Kelly, I'll hand it over to you. Hi, my name is Kelly Alsop, and I am a horticulture educator. I serve Livingston, McLean, and Woodford counties. My specialty within the team is integrated pest management. However, I love dabbling in all the other things. Um, I love vegetable gardening. I love trees. Who doesn't love trees, really? I love all kinds of flowers, but uh, definitely uh, the um, the insects really are um, more my specialty. However, we have an, an, an expert today, so uh, hopefully she can teach us all something new. And I'm the woman from Day of the Dead. I borrowed this costume from my eight-year-old niece. How do you think it looks? She actually made it. She did a pretty good job. Oh, yeah, she did. a Great job. It's really nice. nice. Thank you, Mirabel. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm Ryan Panko. I'm a horticulture educator out of Champaign, so I serve uh, Champaign, Ford, Iroquois, and Vermilion Counties in central Illinois. Uh, my specialty is trees and shrubs and woody plants. That's uh, kind of my first area of expertise, but... I also like vegetable gardening and a lot of other aspects of gardening, so um, definitely have other areas of interest. And today, I am wearing a beekeeping suit to protect myself from any big creepy bugs that show up on the show or any big giant bees that might be here today. So, uh, Perfect. And we didn't even coordinate the bee and the beekeeper. We didn't <laughs> and even and you, you're, you're the queen bee. The queen. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> so you're going to overwinter this year, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks, guys. I want to mention first before we start, definitely make sure you check out our um, Extension Horticulture Facebook group. If you're not in there already, that's a great place to ask questions in between um, shows and we'll get a link uh, for that for you in the chat box. But I definitely want to get our special guest today introduced, Sarah Hewson. And Sarah, I'll let you kind of share your background and what your expertise is in. Okay, so my name is Sarah Hewson. I'm on the U of I campus. I'm in the pesticide safety education program. So I primarily teach, you know, safe handling and usage of pesticides, both for people and the environment. And I also do IDs for the public. So folks may send their um, ID questions or insect questions to me, or they may send them to, you know, your local extension office or the U of I plant clinic. Um, and then a lot of the, well, maybe not a lot of those questions, but some of those questions are then fielded to me as well. So um, I can help the public with insect ID, um, some advice for management um, and that type of thing. Awesome. Excellent. Well, we're happy to have you today. So like I mentioned, if you have insect specific questions, definitely start adding those into the comment box and we'll get to those today or any other gardening questions. We're happy to answer too. Uh, but I think we're going to kick it off by talking a little bit about the brown marmorated stink bug. I know I myself have been battling these guys in my house like crazy this fall. And when, when we've had some sunny, warm days, they've just been covering my windows and they'll try to sneak in at every crack and crevice. So I think we've got some photos and some slides to share to talk about that, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll go ahead and share my screen here. I've got some slides for us. Excellent. Okay, let's see. So on the first slide here, I've um, got some examples of brown marmorated stink bugs. So in the top right, we have the adult insect. And the main way you ID this insect is by looking for a couple specific characteristics. 
Now, the first one is that it has striped antennae. So if you guys actually look at the antenna in this picture, um, the one in the foreground here, you can see that it's mostly brown, but near some articulation points, it actually has some white coloration. So that's going to be the main characteristic you look for. Sorry, in this to, insect. Sorry to interrupt yeah. you, Sarah. Ryan, do you want to make that bigger so we can see those pictures better? Is that better? Yep, there we go. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about um, the that. Next, that's all right. So the, the next characteristic you look for is along the edge of the abdomen. You can see some banding um, along the edge there. So you'll see mostly a pale color with that dark banding along the edge. The other thing you see with this insect is that it has kind of a rounded shoulder area. And that's something that you use to kind of separate it out from some of the other stink bugs that we have in the area. So for example, one of the stink bugs we see quite often is gonna be your soldier bug. And that one actually has really sharp pointed shoulder area. And that one is actually a predator. So that one's beneficial in the area. And now below here, I've also got some images of the young. So in the first picture on the left, you can see some nymphs that have just hatched. And at this stage, it's actually really difficult to ID them and separate them out from other stink bugs we have in the area. They kind of all look the same at this stage. And then on the bottom right, uh, we have an older nymph. So this is the last nymphal instar before it molts to the adult stage. And this one starts to look a little more distinct. So in this one, you can see it does have a broad body, those rounded shoulders, and you can see that striping on the antennae with this young one as well. Now, um, Ryan, if you switch to the next slide, um, I can show you guys some, uh, one lookalike that we have. Now on the bottom left of this slide, this one is actually called brown stink bug. So we have brown marmorated stink bug in the area, and we also have just brown stink bug. And this one is actually a native species, and this is gonna be the closest lookalike that we have. Now, the main thing you'll see with this one is it also has kind of a broad brown body. It has some kind of rounded shoulders. They're slightly pointier. Um, it does have that banding around the abdomen, but it does not have the stripes on the antennae. So usually when folks are asking about ID characteristics, I would tell them to look for the stripes on the antennae to confirm brown marmorated stink bug versus this just plain brown stink bug. So you can see that brown stink bug just has brown antennae with no different um, no different coloration on that. So Sarah, does the brown stink bug come into your house the way the brown marmorated stink bugs are doing this fall? They can, they can sometimes, um, but less frequently. Uh, sometimes I actually will go and try to take a picture of a brown marmorated stink bug on a screen or something like that. And then when I actually blow that picture up on my computer screen, I realize, oops, I got brown stink bug. So. It does happen, they're, they're pretty easy to mix up. Um, and in Illinois, uh, we actually only had brown marmorated stink bug come into Illinois in 2010. Um, and it's actually only been in the last few years that we've really seen these guys kind of pick up and start to become a household pest. So actually up until the last few years, I would see the brown stink bug more frequently than brown marmorated in my area anyway. I know that kind of depends on what you've got going on in your specific location. I know, um, Sarah, like, I think it was like four or five years ago, I did a trapping project for brown marmorated stink bug. And, you know, used the official traps that, that the uh, companies sell, didn't find one single stink bug. But then my boss gives me a, a stink bug she finds in her office, and it's a brown marmorated stink bug. Yeah. So it shows that, you know, five years ago, the population was really low, but now it's starting to really build up. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I know um, the first couple of years after this was ID'd in Illinois, and I moved to Illinois in 2010 as well. So I kind of showed up around the same time as this bug. And the first couple of years, I never saw a single one, you know, outside of somebody actually giving me a sample. But yeah, now they're pretty easy to find. I've already found a few this year in the house. <laughs> yeah, like I said, on a sunny day, I've had loads of them just coating <laughs> the side of my house. And I haven't even looked closely to ID which one it which one it is. I just kind of assume at this point that it's uh, the brown marmorated. Yeah, and and it probably is at this point. Yeah, so I don't I don't think I've had any um, just brown stink bug yet yet this year in the house. Yeah. 
So some of the main things that you'll see with these guys is that they'll start actually coming into homes or, or sticking to the side of houses in September, October. Um, the main reason that they're going to be doing that is because they kind of want to get away from those cooling temperatures. So what they're going to do is find any little kind of crack or crevice they can find and wedge their way in there. They'll typically overwinter as adults. Um, so that's what you're actually going to see happening. They're going to be looking for a little crevice that they can squeeze into uh, so they can go dormant for the winter. And what will end up happening is if they kind of move into like a window screen or something like that, uh, throughout the winter, if we have kind of a warmer day or you have a lot of sun coming into that windowsill, it'll warm up and they'll actually wake up. So, and they'll start walking around. So that's why sometimes in midwinter, you might see like the stink bug just kind of wandering around and you're wondering like, what are you doing here? So <laughs> they just kind of warmed up and they thought it was spring. So they thought it was time to come out. Nice. Okay, we have two good questions here on this. Um, Marge asks, where did they come from? So if they've only been here since 2010, where yeah. would they come from? So brown marmorated stink bug is originally from Asia. Um, I think the introduction that we had in the U.S. might specifically have been from China, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, they actually first came into Pennsylvania at around uh, 98. So they've actually spread from that area toward us. Gotcha. Okay, excellent. And then Jackie also asks, so talking about the native and the non-native, are they similar in size? Would, would size be able to tell you any difference? They, they are really similar in size. Um, the brown marbrated stink bug is a little bit broader, a little bit wider. But honestly, I, I feel like that difference is kind of negligible. Um, so really the best way to ID is to get that close look and look at the antennae. Yeah, look for that striping. And so how this is going to affect most people, Sarah, is they're going to see these, you know, as home invaders, right? But it's, but it's an invasive species. And why should we be concerned about it? Well, they can also be um, a pretty significant agricultural pest, um, and they can also be a pest of ornamental plants. Now, um, most of the trees and things that you actually would normally have in a yard as an ornamental tree, or even some of the native trees, they can feed on. Um, so we do have a lot of really good habitat for these guys. They actually have a host range of like something like 300 different species of plant that they can feed on. Um, and they might, you know, start in the spring feeding on ornamental plants, uh, but as the season progresses, maybe they're going to move into fruit and veg or some field crops and things like that. Now, for our ornamentals in Illinois, um, I don't think we have enough of them that, that folks would actually be treating them on ornamentals at this point, um, but they, they can be a pretty significant pest of, you know, fruit and veg or field crops, and we do see folks treating them on those types of plants. Um, would Oh, sorry. Would the damage typically show up later in the season or would it be kind of all season? Is there a particular time? You, you would see it a little bit later in the season. Um, Ryan, can you pull up the presentation again? Yeah, I have sure. a, as an example of the injury. And while, while you're doing that, you were talking about host ranges. There was a comment in there that someone recently learned that the invasive plant butterfly bush is one of the host plants for stink bugs. Yeah. So it sounds like there's a lot. Yeah, they honestly, basically everything you have in your yard, they might be able to eat. They, they really have a broad host range. I found them on my tomatoes this year, oh. Sarah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I did see some examples of the, the damage on tomatoes. So I kind of made, I, I guess I could have shown that here, but I've kind of shown some of the fruits since they tend to be um, bigger pests on those types of cash crops like your apples and peaches. Um, now, in the first image on the left here, I've got an example of this insect's mouth part. So they actually have kind of a straw-like mouth part, and it's sort of piercing. So what they'll do is kind of stick that into a fruit to suck juices out of that, or they'll stick that even into um, through the bark of some types of trees and suck fluids from those trees. Now, when they do this type of feeding on different types of fruits, as they pierce into that, some of their saliva can actually damage some of the cells there. So as that fruit continues to grow, those cells have died and they don't grow. So what you'll get is this kind of cat facing injury. So uh, what you'll see on the fruit is actually kind of a puckered area where that plant has died, or you might find some browning as you cut into that plant. Um, so on top here, we have an example of a young peach that has some cat facing injury. Um, and just below that, we have an image of some apples that have multiple um, marks where these insects have pierced the plant. 
So that's the main type of damage um, you do see in agriculture from those guys. Good to know, good to know. There was a question Paula asked, um, what plant do they usually swarm? Is there any particular plant over the other that? They, they don't really have like a swarming behavior um, the way like bees would or something like that. Um, in the fall, though, you might see them congregate on certain types of trees that they prefer over others um, because they are looking for those nice little crevices in the bark and things where they can overwinter. Very good. And John asked, do native stink bugs sneak into houses? They can, right? The native ones as well? Yeah. I think they, they don't do that as frequently, but, you know, it's possible. They're going to do the same thing where they're looking for a nice place to hide for the winter here. So the question that we always get, Sarah, right, is how do you get rid of them? Get rid of them. So the main way to do that, and I think this is true for a lot of your different types of home invaders, is to just ID any types of crevices and, and entry points you have in the house and then seal those up. So that might be just, you know, making sure you have a screen that's fitted really well inside that window. They can't wedge in between. And these guys, uh, their bodies are actually really flattened. So they can really fit into some tight spaces to get into the house. Um, some other things that folks might be thinking about are um, locations where maybe there are outlets or pipes coming out of the side of the house. If there's kind of gaps around that, um, that's something you might want to fill in with spray foam. Um, if you have some maybe vent on the side of the attic, maybe you want to put a screen on the inside of that that prevents them from coming into that attic area um, or moving into um, kind of wall voids and things like that. So that exclusion is really the main way to prevent them from coming in. Um, if they're already in the house and you need to get rid of them, um, the main way to do that would be maybe vacuuming them up or kind of picking them up, putting them in a container and putting that container in the freezer. That is one really good way to dispatch them without them kind of making their little stink um, when they feel threatened. Um, if you do vacuum them up, you can take that, that free or sorry, that vacuum bag, and you could put that in the freezer or you could tie that clothes in a plastic bag and put it in the outside um, trash can, that kind of thing. But um, if you ever see videos of these guys, you know, like out on the East Coast, sometimes people will have just thousands of them in their house and, and you'll see images of people that are just kind of like, you know, flung open the patio door and they're actually like sweeping them outside. There's so many. <laughs> Let's hope we don't get to that point, yeah. right? <laughs> That's yeah, it's kind little... of the same treatment for those multicolored Asian ladybugs, right? They come in, you know, I, I remember living in a house where we just had like a jar of soapy water and every now and then we just, you know, put them in the soapy water. Yeah, and that's a good one. Um, that's another one you can do with the brown marmorated stink bug is knock them into that soapy water. Um, I don't know if um, everybody maybe knows why you want to use soapy water versus just plain tap water for that. Do you guys want a quick explanation? Yeah, you yeah. want to know. Yeah. Yeah. So basically what happens with a lot of insects, because they have this, um, a lot of surface area on their body, um, when they actually hit just still water, it's hard for them to break that surface tension. So they'll just kind of float on top of the water. But when you actually add the soap, it completely breaks that surface tension. So they drop right into the water and sink to the bottom. So that, that's the main reason you just add maybe like a couple drops of dish soap and you're good to go. Uh, Sarah, I used to apply that in the greenhouse because I would have, I would fill my soil, fill some of my pots with soils. And then sometimes it was really hard for me to wet in those pots of soil. And so I would add a couple of drops of soap and it would make it so much easier for me to wet in the soil in the greenhouse. Yeah, that's a good idea. I've never thought of doing that. <laughs> well, you know, if you have really hard, wet, wet, hard to wet media, right? Candace, Candace yeah. was probably there at times that, when what's it that happened. Thing? You Lost had right. to break that water tension somehow. Good tip. Good tip. Let's see. I think we had a question come in there. Um, if there were bite marks on tomatoes, is it still safe to eat the fruit? Um, yeah, I, I don't think that there's any reason um, not to eat the fruit at that point. I mean, it might be a good idea just to kind of cut away that damaged portion because sometimes um, when you have the fruit begin to die, you get like kind of some fungal growth or weird things like that. But um, I don't think there's any reason to not eat the rest of the plant if you cut away the damaged portion. 
Yeah, just cut those parts off. I, I haven't heard any information about that um, being a problem. I know sometimes with like coddling moth and things like that, um, they'll actually chew their way through an apple to the center. Um, and actually they'll leave these kind of like frass tunnels, which uh, frass is the droppings from the insect. Um, and actually that will grow some kind of fungal materials and you really don't want to eat that. Um, yeah. But you could potentially cut that away and eat other portions. Good point. Yeah, so for the home gardener's sake, it's easy to cut off and, and just eat your eat your tomato like your meal. It's that's when it gets that real problem is that agriculture producer when they're trying to sell a tomato that looks like that. Obviously, it's gonna be yeah. difficult for a consumer to want yeah. that. And a lot of an organic fruit grower that I would see how that this could be a potential issue for them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because the industry for those types of cash crops is not really like accepting of, you know, having blemishes on the surface of the, mm. the fruit. Yeah, they want a nice person. That's our job. Eat ugly apples. <laughs> and we all chant. I get excited when I buy ugly apples. I know that they have not been over sprayed with pesticides. <laughs> Okay, let's see, a couple other questions. Um, how about flushing them down the toilet? Would that be a good way to get rid of them? You could do that. Um, I, I don't really see a problem with doing that. Uh, the only thing I've seen is um, on you know out in the East Coast where they have just tons of these, um, then people start to get concerned about like water waste because you're doing it so frequently. Um, right. Here in the Midwest, I, I don't see a problem with that. That would be pretty similar to putting them in the cup of soapy water. Very good. You know, I've, I've had pretty good luck with just a vacuum, and I guess it's not necessarily on the stink bugs, but on those those lady beetles. Um, I, I've had, that's been my biggest indoor pest, honestly, and uh, just, you know, vacuuming those up, and I have a vacuum with a real easy to empty canister, and just getting it outside and emptying that as soon as possible. I guess I didn't really kill them, <laughs> but at least removed them from the house and put them into the waste stream or whatever, yeah. so. Um, yeah, and I, I know one of the things I kind of use, I have like a little handy vac where the, mm -hmm. the container pops off in the end and that, that works just fine. Yeah, um, that's what yeah. I do too. Lady beetles, ants, whatever. <laughs> I keep it on the counter whenever I see them, I zap them up and then head outside and just pop the container out and off they go, yeah. You know, we, we Sarah, you talked for a minute about how to kind of, uh, you know, better uh, protect the outside of your house from these insects getting in and I, I mean, I can I can definitely tell folks from experience it does really work to go around and seal up those cracks, uh, but at the get go, that just seems like this daunting task. When you start really looking, especially if you have an old home, when you start looking at the outside of your house and where is every place there's a crack. But um, but you know, just using you know, you mentioned foam or like caulk or something that can fill those cracks. Um, I was amazed at how just, you know, an afternoon worth of work on the south side of my house, especially for those beetles, which is sunny and would really attract them on these warm fall days, um, just how much difference that made with just, a, you know, an afternoon's worth of work on a ladder and kind of sealing up those cracks. And, um, you know, we went from having literally hundreds of those things in our kitchen to, oh you know, a, a manageable amount that you could just kind of vacuum up once a day and really not have much of an issue with them. And so, really encourage folks to go that route. That's probably the best way just to, you know, really reduce your numbers indoors anyway. Mm -hmm. And then honestly, that's a really good strategy for just excluding any kind of pests that you don't want coming into the house in the fall. Um, so even if we're talking about, you know, like the vents um, up in the attic and things like that, if you screen those, that can prevent bats from coming in um, and, and other types of insects as well. That can keep wasps out in the summer even. So You know, the area that I found the area that I found on my house in particular that really needed some work was kind of the soffit or the under part oh, yeah. of my, you know, where my roof hangs over. And it's because it was that aluminum siding kind of stuff. And it was just kind of slid in there and just kind of sits free floating on a track. And so just by going down that, you know, where those two tracks met and just kind of putting a bead of caulk all through there. I mean, I think that alone was really what really cut out a lot of those insects being able to get in. So Sometimes it's just that one major major gap that you've got, and once you get it, you know you're in pretty good shape. Yeah, and I think that's one of the the major recommendations I see too is is around the the soffit or different types of flashing around around the edge of the roof. That mm -hmm. is one of the primary places they come in. And I know that some pest control companies even offer a service where they'll come and and look for and fill in those gaps for folks 
um, if they you know don't have the right tool for the job or if they don't have the time to do it themselves. Yeah, that's a good tip. Okay, I think we had another one. Um, Paul asked, "How do you stop them from laying eggs in your house?" So are they are oh. they doing that this time of year? They actually are not doing that this time of year. They they don't reproduce in the home, so they'll just overwinter there, um, and then in the spring they kind of come out and, well, I guess once they've gotten in the house, they're kind of in the house, right? They're not as good at getting back out. Um, but it's not their their intent to be in your home laying eggs and doing things like that. Um, that's going to be an activity that happens outdoors in the spring, and they will lay their eggs on different types of plants. That's not, so, yeah, that's not, that's not a huge concern. Um, they're, they're not trying to reproduce in the house. Good to know. That's a hallelujah. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one good thing you've said. Right <laughs> They're not going to lay babies in your house. You know, just keep the vacuum handy and stay on top of them. <laughs> awesome. Well, we have a lot of great questions on brown. We're talking about brown marmorated stink bug. If you've joined us late and we had a ton of great uh, questions there. Any last minute thoughts on that that we might have missed? Do you think we covered it pretty good? I think we covered it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm going to go scroll back up here. I think we've got some other questions um, to address. So let's see. Over on YouTube, we've got a composting insect question. Um, John says, this is my first year composting, and I'm using a rolling barrel style bin. Uh, it's been populated by black soldier fly larva. Uh, he said it happened on its own. There's hundreds, if not thousands of them. And he said, it's awesome. They quickly eat all of our food scraps and pumpkin guts. Uh, but he's concerned that everything is going to turn into a block of ice this winter. Would you recommend moving the bin into the garage? Um, he'd like to keep them alive and keep feeding them our food scraps. So black soldier fly larva in a compost bin. What do you think? Yeah, honestly, not sure. I've never really thought about the survival of things in the compost bin like that. Um, and I guess the thing that makes it different is that this is, right, it's the tumbling compost bin, so it's up off the ground. Typically, if, you know, in your usual type of compost, um, the creatures could actually, some of the creatures that are, are your macro decomposers like that could actually move back into the soil for warmth. Um, I still I mean, think that it would be, I'm sorry, I still think that it would be emitting some warmth, right? Yeah, I mean, it is it is compost, and, and as it decomposes, it does create some heat. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if, if we had, like, really cold days, if it could freeze through. I'm not really sure how that works with compost, to be honest. But, I mean, certainly you could move it into the garage if you were concerned about, about that. It probably has a lot to do with how much and how often you're adding stuff as to how much heat it's producing. You know, we know we know that everything in that process slows down in cold weather. So um, you're going to have to have a lot of inputs probably to keep that warm. But I, I guess I wouldn't know either if it truly freezes solid or if it can stay um, unfrozen. I, I tend to do the on the ground kind of compost bin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking if you, if you have the space in the garage and the ability that that you you certainly could. I would just be aware that once the larvae matures, you're going to have flies, of course, <laughs> uh, coming out of that. But well, if you're interested in using insects for composting, there's a ton of info out there about vermicomposting, and I've I've tried it in the past, and it is I could keep up with the worms that I had in my <laughs> my compost yeah. bin. So uh, that might be something worth checking into, and um, I, there's a lot of great info out there on it. I too, Ryan, have vermicomposted on my kitchen table. Yeah. <laughs> you would have thought, gross, Kelly, gross. You no know, smells. They eat it up. Just beautiful to watch. The kids loved it. Yeah. Yeah, I did it on a little bit larger of a scale outside where I had uh, my, my father-in-law actually built these for me. It was just a, you know, kind of a square frame and three of those frames that had a screen on the bottom. So, you know, those worms could move upward or downward. I'm trying to remember how we stack that. But uh, basically, I think we started in the bottom frame and filled it up. And as soon as that got full, then we put another one on and the worms would just kind of move up to where the better compost was. And it was an awesome system. It worked great. But just between, you know, for my own household, we weren't making enough scraps to fill that 
is probably a two foot by two foot square for each one of those little bins, uh, but just worked wonderfully. And I'm sure if I did a better job of mixing in my yard clippings and some other stuff, you know, we were strictly doing it with kitchen scraps where I had a whole different system for all my outdoor waste. I probably could have kept that going pretty well, but just, just like you observed, Kelly, not a single smell. I mean, they, I was just shocked at how fast they could do their job, you know? Me too. Yeah. Yeah. It was really interesting. Which type of worms are in that? Is that like mealworms or is that like the little red worms? Red wigglers. Yeah. Red yeah. yeah. I just ordered it off the internet. I just ordered red wigglers off the internet, ordered mm -hmm. a kid started composting you know i just put table scraps i didn't even you know do you know the the mix of browns and greens it was wonderful it was easy yeah super easy awesome okay one follow-up question about the stink bugs sarah um can these bugs bite the stink bugs bite um, so i like to tell folks that anything with a mouth can bite you <laughs> uh, but uh these guys typically they don't do that um, I, I've actually never really met somebody who's been bitten by a brown marmorated stink bug. Um, their main defense, if you do handle them roughly, um, is that they will expel um, kind of a, a stinky liquid. And, and that's, that's mainly what they do. Um, I suppose they could bite you and it would probably give you um, a bit of a pinch, um, but that's probably about it. Yeah, I haven't yeah, noticed noticed anything. So yet. with Sarah, with the late with the lady beetles, um, they they are able to bite or do something. Like they would do something yeah. that hurt. Um, I've heard a lot of people say that they've been bitten by those, and they um, they don't have a piercing sucking mouth part like the brown marmorated stink bug. Um, they actually have mandibles, so they they literally can give you a little bit of a pinch. Um, I think I've been bitten by those like one time, um, and it wasn't. It wasn't a lot to write home about, so. <laughs> yeah, it, it wasn't, when I've been bitten, it wasn't super painful. It just was something that, um, you know, startling. You know, all of a sudden this bug, you're inside and an insect bites you. Um, so I don't know, not, not a big deal, but um, that that's what kind of drove us to really try and get rid of them was the fact that they were biting us on occasion and made us really kind of think it was a problem then at that point. <laughs> And I will say, I, I'm a little bit biased because I've been bit by just about everything. So um, I, I'm like, oh, yeah, those guys aren't a big deal. But I, I can see if you're not used to being bitten by different creatures, um, that would be, you know, pretty surprising. Well, and this is also coming from the guy that's sitting here in protective gear. So, <laughs> so uh, we did uh, just to lead to a different topic. Sarah, we did just, you know, kind of complete a season of these other types of biting insects that us in the extension office get lots of questions on. And those are the minute pirate bugs. Where are those guys at right now? Yeah. So some, some years we'll have, you know, larger populations of minute pirate bugs than others. Um, and, and we do have some types of insects that will have these kind of cycles where like one year you have a big population then you have like a few years with like an average population. Maybe you have a year with a really low population. So I think this year is, is one of those cyclic years where we, we do have a bigger population. Um, and we had kind of like a warm, damp season, which is, is a little bit beneficial for them. Um, and, and the thing about the minute pirate bugs is they, they can bite you and they can raise a bit of a bump and it is kind of itchy and uncomfortable. Um, but we generally think of those guys as beneficials because they are predators. They they actually feed on other insects. Um, and when they bite us, it's kind of like incidental. Like they landed someplace and they're like, hmm, I'm sitting here, maybe I'll have a taste, right? So they're not actually like seeking people out to bite them. Mm -hmm. um, they, they are actually really beneficial in feeding on aphids and other soft-bodied insects like that. So not like a mosquito that does want to bite us. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. seeks your blood. <laughs> yeah. The fire bugs are not interested in your blood. <laughs> and that's why the off spray or the sprays that we use for mosquitoes doesn't work with the minute pirate bugs because they're not seeking that blood, right? Yeah. They're, yeah. I mean, they're, they're not really seeking us out in the first place. So if you use a repellent, um, they would still have to come in contact with you to be in contact with that repellent. So it's still it's still kind of like these in incidental encounters. Yeah. So best bet would be release them. Sorry. No, go ahead. We used to release them in the greenhouse. So it is that that reason 
why I allow them to live after they bit me because they, I, I feel like some people are more susceptible to those bites than others. They really get me bad and they must know that I love them and am unwilling to kill them because I don't kill them. I just shoo them away. But yeah, this year I thought they, they were, they were after me. Well, so that, that is, that is really interesting how different folks react differently to bug bites. And I, you know, and, and mosquitoes are one where in my own family, you know, there's members that aren't even getting bit and I'm the one that's getting just drilled by mosquitoes. Um, I guess it just has to do with your personal scent or um, how sweet you are. <laughs> So they are attracted to a number of different things. So mosquitoes can be attracted to um, CO2. So as we breathe out, they, they're like, ooh, a mammal's over there. Um, so that's, you know, like one good way they can start to like orient themselves to you. Um, but they can also smell um, like different types of, I guess, uh, anaerobic things that we have going on in our bodies. So um, they'll be attracted to that. And I've also read that certain blood types are more attractive to them. So there's a lot of different things uh, that are going to make you more or less attractive to those insects. Um, I know uh, I did my PhD um, on Western corn rootworm beetle. And one of the main things we did was walk cornfields with a box of dry ice, like a little cooler. And we would collect insects onto the dry ice to preserve them. Um, and I will say, if you are walking around in a damp cornfield with a box full of dry ice that's emitting CO2, you get a lot of mosquito bites. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> that would probably be the only time they didn't bite me. Because Ryan, like you, they come after me. I must have the appropriate blood type. I have read that also, that blood type can play into it. So... Uh, uh, mosquitoes, the only insect I really hate. <laughs> That's a rough one, yeah. Okay, let me see. I think we had a question up here, which is I think it will be a good segue because we mentioned uh, that we might talk about spiders. So let's maybe um, switch gears to that next. Megan asks, um, wants to know the best way to get rid of wolf spiders. They have problems inside and outside and around their pool. So you want to talk about that a little bit? So with the wolf spiders, I think the same thing um, as with the brown marmorated stink bug, where you want to kind of focus on exclusion um, and kind of sealing gaps. Because if you do have them kind of hanging out around the house, um, as it, it does cool down, they do find their way inside. So uh, some of the main things that do come inside are like, you know, millipedes, sow bugs, crickets, um, but then, yeah, your spiders and your stink bugs and your uh, multicolor Asian lady beetle as well. Uh, I know with the spiders, uh, another thing that can happen is that they, they do like to visit water sources. So that might be one of the reasons you do see them around the pool. And really not much you could do there, right? I mean, that's just the environment that, they're, that they um, like. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the main thing um, is that, that that's kind of like normal habitats where they would hang out. Um, if you do, uh, in some cases, if there are, um, I'm trying to think, uh, different types of items like around the edges of the house, you could kind of um, reduce habitat around the edge of the house. So um, if maybe there's like a wood pile up against the house, like that's a place where spiders like to hang out, um, brown recluse and things like that, um, do like those type of small habitats where they can kind of wedge into small spaces. Um, your wolf spiders are going to like that too. So one of the things we do often recommend is, you know, if somebody has a wood pile, maybe um, have that up against a fence away from the house and, and not right up against the house. So um, those types of structures that do have a lot of crevices are something that would be attractive to them. Wolf spiders aren't intending to inhabit the house, right, Sarah? No, I mean, that's another one um, that just sort of comes in by mistake. They don't really, they don't really want to be there. They don't really have a solid food source there. So once they're inside, probably they want to get back out. Yeah. But their food source would be a lot of the bugs we don't like, right? It could be, yeah. <laughs> um, those crickets, that would be, you know, really attractive to them. <laughs> yeah. So you could leave it there as future pest control. 
We just had a, yeah. we just had a comment that said that I like having wolf spiders around because it's free pest control. So it is. Yeah. <laughs> Another one that I really like having in the house is not really an insect, but um, the house centipedes. Um, I know that those are kind of freaky looking, and a lot of people don't like those, but. Uh, they're actually really, really good beneficial critters to have around the house because they will eat some of those insects. Hmm. Good to know. Now, you're a girl after my own heart. I never kill centipedes either. <laughs> never. I just let them do their thing. Yeah, I, I like the centipedes. Um, and in particular, like the centipedes and the crickets, I tend to like just leave and let them do their thing. Um, and, you know, the centipede can take care of some of the crickets, but... Honestly, my cat really loves both. <laughs> She's Love entertainment her. for her cat. Please. Hey, yeah. and win. <laughs> so there's not really, so that really does segue into Ryan's question. There's not really a lot of spiders in Illinois that are really out there to get you, but Ryan wanted to talk about one that is a um, potential threat to your health. So, uh, Ryan. Yeah, um, well, actually, I meant to prepare some slides for this. I'm realizing I don't have those. Uh, but uh, what I want to talk about was brown recluses. And that's because um, before I moved to Champaign County, I lived down in Union County in southern Illinois. And our house had a ton of them. And it was always kind of a question of how dangerous are these guys? Should we worry about them or what should we do? So, Sarah, what's your, what's your take on those uh, little spiders? I would say... Um, for the most part, um, if people do get bitten by this brown recluse, and, and it's not very frequently that people do get bitten by them, um, when people do, oftentimes, you know, they'll have a small wound and it will heal. Um, but in some cases, you know, folks do have a bad reaction to that, that venom that they inject when they bite. Um, and, and that is a good one to, if, if you think that you're having a problem or if you have like a wound that's not quite healing, like definitely go to the doctor and have that one checked out. Um, but, you know, like I said, for the most part, these are, are creatures that you don't encounter very frequently, even when you are in proximity to them. Um, they do not seek people out. They would rather stay, you know, hiding in that wood pile or, you know, like a pile of newspapers or crevices in uh, masonry and things like that. They, they like to hide out and eat small insects. Uh, so they, they don't typically seek people out. Um, it's when maybe somebody's kind of going rummaging around in those areas that that they encounter them or they um, are threatened or touched, and that's the time when they might bite. Yeah, I'd say most of what we saw were really exoskeletons of those spiders. It, it was rare that we, you know, we would see them from time to time when we moved something, but, you know, more it was just signs of, the, of them that we saw that raised concern. And, and, you know, mostly in our basement. It wasn't like it was all over your house and everywhere, but... Um, I, I, I feel like they're more, like now that I moved to Central Illinois, I don't really have that issue. Are they more of a Southern species in the state or what's their distribution? They're actually more, more of a Southern species in general. So a lot of the habitat that you see for them is going to be in the South or Southwest. Um, and uh, I guess maybe Central Illinois is kind of, kind of the Northern portion of their range. So we don't have as many of those. Um, and the map that I'm thinking of is maybe a few years old. So they might be, uh, they might be further north than that, or they may just not have, you know, confirmed um, distributions or things like that, or that might be the actual cutoff in the central Illinois area. Um, so um, that is one thing to think of. We, we do have them here in our area in, uh, on campus in Champaign-Urbana. Um, I do know a couple people that have encountered them. Um, and one person was bitten by them and did have um, kind of a, a more severe outcome, though uh, he is fine now. So that is um, one thing that we can see happen. That is something that we do have locally. And I wouldn't say that, you know, folks need to be like looking out for this all the time. Um, but they, if they are in, you know, like you said, kind of like a basement area, if there's a good amount of clutter, it might be good to just um, kind of declutter those areas or reduce hiding places for those insects, or for those spiders. Sarah, I but think I, I brought up an image for you. Can you see it? Yes, I can see that now. Can you teach people how to identify a brown recluse? Yeah, so um, the main way to do this is to look at the coloration on the spider. So with your spiders, um, they have a little bit different body structure than our insects. Our insects are gonna have that head, thorax, abdomen area. Um, your spiders are gonna have two major body regions. So they're gonna have the abdomen in the rear, 
And then they're going to have um, the front structure, which is called the episposome. And that is basically um, fulfilling the function of both the head and the thorax in the insect, but in one kind of fused structure. Now, the major way you ID this animal is by looking for this coloration on um, that epithmosome, the um, head thorax area, and what you'll see is kind of a violin-shaped dark area. So the wide end of the violin is toward the head and the mouth, um, and the skinny portion of that violin um, is toward the rear. So that will end um, at the beginning of the abdomen. And that's pretty recognizable it, from what I've seen. You know, I, I could usually pick that out pretty easy. And yeah. and little, they're small. They're not very, not very big spiders. In yeah, they're, they're pretty small. And, you know, it's one of those, those kind of cool things about identifying certain types of creatures is once you learn, you know, that one ID characteristic and you've had a really good look at it, you kind of keep that search image so you can spot it a little bit easier in the future. So if somebody were to have brown recluse in their homes, what would your um, advice be? Um, I think, you know, the main thing would be um, to, again, kind of remove some of that habitat. Um, because this is a, a creature that has a potential to cause some injury, a lot of times folks do recommend, you know, having somebody out to look at that or to um, clear out or or fill in different types of gaps and things like that just to reduce risk. Um, but again, this is not um, a creature that really seeks people out. Um, it's not something that honestly I've ever encountered personally. Um, so I, I don't think they're, they're super common in the area that they do exist in the area. Keep an eye out for <laughs> Candace, your house is very clean. It is, but I clearly have lots of gaps because I have all the gaps. <laughs> <laughs> so well, uh, you need to get on it. Start looking around the house. I know. Um, let's see. We had a comment here. Uh, Joseph said uh, recluse spiders are unusual because they only have six eyes. Is that indeed? You know, I don't know how many eyes they have, to be honest. Me neither. Um, there's a lot of different, a lot of different types of spiders actually have different numbers or numbers of eyes. Um, so that that might be something that varies by family. I'm not really sure um, what that variation is for the number of eyes. Yeah, yeah, well, I have an to... eye chart. I have an eye chart where you're supposed to, because they're true. Well, you know, I mean, I don't have to say this to you, Sarah, but they say to truly identify a spider, you have to look at the eyes. Okay. And so I have like an eye chart. But let me tell you, sometimes looking at spider eyes underneath a microscope is not as easy as no. you think it would be. And so, and I'll, I'll be honest, I have, I am, I am trained in insect uh -huh. ID, but uh, I've never been specifically trained in spider ID. Though I do know, you know, some of the local species. One of my favorite resources for spider identification is. Um, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking here. Um, is it a book? It's from Chicago. Okay. Um, let me look it up and um, put it in the chat for Aaron, but it's just, I, 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 I'm sorry. To back up Sarah's point, yeah, you know, the, you know, us people who are supposed to be into insects, this is, we use those little tidbits that helps us identify them. We don't always use the eyes. So the um, gentleman with the question probably, um, you know, very true. But, uh, um, but uh, so I use like little charts and things to help me out when identifying spiders. I'm sure Sarah does the same thing. But I will add it to the screen and stop talking. Go ahead. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Kelly. So we've got about 10 minutes left. So if you have uh, questions still lingering, add them to the comment box. I think we've we've caught up on um, questions for the time being. So we've got 10 more minutes with our Sarah, our insect expert. So let us know uh, what you've got. Um, do you want to touch on kind of spotted lanternfly quick since we're caught up on um, questions? Sure. Yeah, I've got a slide to share. I can start off with, but uh, 
more. Sure, you know the you know the most about this. So do you mind kind of giving folks a little background yeah. of what this insect is and what it means to us? So spotted lanternfly is an introduced species. Um, this is another kind of invasive introduced species. And this is one that we, we don't currently have in Illinois, uh, but it is kind of become a sort of an outbreak pest um, in the Pennsylvania area. And this is another one that we just want to keep an eye out for uh, because it is really easily transported from place to place. So we just want to make sure everybody knows that this insect exists, knows what it looks like. Uh, that way, if anybody encounters it for the first time in Illinois, they can call in and report it. Um, and if you do see it and you want to report it, you could report it to um, USDA, your local extension person. You could uh, report it to Department of uh, Illinois Department of Agriculture. Um, there are a lot of different opportunities for reporting these guys if people want to do that. So uh, what we're looking at here is a picture of your spotted lanternfly adult. And on the bottom right, this is kind of the characteristic image that we're going to see of this insect um, as people, you know, put out pest alerts or ID guides for this. And what this is, is um, a killed adult, and they've actually spread the wings so that you can see this brightly colored underwing on this insect. Um, but if you actually encounter this insect in the wild, you're not going to see it in this type of pose unless it's actively flying. So what you're gonna see is something more like this top left image where the insect looks a little more drab. It's mostly kind of gray, um, but you can see through the upper wing a little bit to the under wing and a little bit of that red coloration. Um, but this is mainly what your adult is gonna look like. And this is an insect that again, has that piercing sucking mouth part. And what it's doing is primarily becoming a pest of fruit crops in particular vineyards and things like that. Uh, because they can actually damage some of the older vines in the vineyard. Um, we do have some other types of pests that will um, harm kind of younger plants, but these guys can actually cause damage to some of the mature plants as well. So that can be really problematic for folks with vineyards that have been going for a really long time. You know, they have these um, older plants that are really well established, um, and these guys can even harm those. And they kind of have to start over in some, some situations. Um, so the big concern with these guys um, in their potential for reaching Illinois is because in the areas where they actually exist in Pennsylvania, um, in a couple of those counties where they're really heavily populated, um, they actually will find them in kind of industrial areas as well because they like to feed on and reproduce on weedy plant, um, including that tree of heaven. And what they'll do is actually sit on the surface of shipping containers. They can actually find their way into open trucks or onto railroad cars and that kind of thing. And, and that is the main concern is that they could potentially be transported to a new location. So they're not actually gonna travel that distance on their own. Um, but again, we do just kind of wanna keep an eye out for hitchhikers um, because these guys can be intensely problematic. And um, again, one of the big concerns with these guys is that their main reproductive host is Tree of Heaven. And we do see that as kind of a weedy margin plant. And um, that is one that is difficult to control. And it's something that we do have a lot of in Illinois. So if this insect does make its way here, uh, we do potentially have a lot of habitat for it, which is a little bit scary. And so you're probably not gonna find just one, right, Sarah? Um, at, you're probably not gonna find just one unless it's something where like, oh, there's a package and there's just one wedge that's way in. Um, but, but if somebody does find these insects, they may find it on a reproductive host like this uh, where they like to lay their eggs and see quite a few of them. Good. And someone commented, um, they just saw yesterday that it's been confirmed in Ohio. And I think I saw that headline too. That's correct, right? Yeah, that's right. So it's getting a little closer. Yeah, moving around a little bit. So we just... We want to keep an eye out um, for this insect. That way we know as soon as it gets here, we can start to take mitigation actions um, and try to eradicate them from those areas. What 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 actions would people in Illinois take? I mean, is it this where we need to go through and start identifying where Tree of Heaven is? Or will, you know, certain pesticides that we already use handle to take care of this guy? Um, that's a good question. So 
Yes, we're going to have um, in broad spectrum insecticides that are going to work on this insect. Um, but I think the main thing that folks will probably be focusing on if when it makes its way here uh, is going to be removing um, tree of heaven and trying to reduce that habitat that would be ideal for it. Um, and I don't know, um, I know tree of heaven can be something that's really difficult to get rid of. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't know if you yeah. guys... You guys might know more about this than me. My understanding is, you know, if you cut this plant off, it starts to send up shoots and the shoots can grow up um, something like 50 feet away from the original plant. So one of the main recommendations that I, I keep hearing from the experts who are dealing with this um, out east is that they want to treat that plant with herbicide before they cut it. That way they can block that, that regrowth response. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, yeah, the plant's response is to shoot, push up shoots from its root system. So whenever you cut it down, um, you're going to have a whole patch after that. Um, they, yeah, from that reaction. So yeah, the recommendation is a cut stump treatment. You know, where you cut that stump off, treat, put herbicide on it right away, and I mean, follow up is huge because even with that systemic herbicide going on the stump. Um, a lot of times where I've seen this plant, it's it's already a colony in a woodland. So as you start to cut down all those stems and try to treat them all, inevitably there's going to be some parts of the root system that systemic herbicides don't make it to, and some of it's going to sprout. So um, it's just one of those invasives that, like many, like re really probably all invasive woody plants require follow-up. But this is one where you cannot skip a beat. If you start, start to initiate control or disturb this uh, area of tree of heaven, you need to be following up and treating any stem that comes up. And really, as, as those sprouts start to come up, you can even switch to a, a foliar spray where you'd spray it on the leaves to control it, and that's effective. But um, the best treatment by far for any woody plant is to cut that stem and treat it right there on the stump or the sprout. And the nice thing about that is that you don't have a lot of non-target exposure, you know, non-target plants to your pesticide because it's right there on that stump that you're treating it. Uh, so, yeah, and I mean, I'm, I'm sure we could all uh, say a lot of negative things about tree of heaven. It's non-native. It um, really grows in a lot of disturbed areas. I mean, you know, the famous places I've seen it growing, I always talk about are the cracks of sidewalks. When a tree can grow in the crack of a sidewalk, that is a tough species. So uh, this is one of those cases where we have two non-native organisms that, you know, we don't want either one of them. So mm -hmm. control both. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think it's like almost, I don't know if it's like, you know, a lucky coincidence for these creatures or kind of like a perfect storm type of situation, but like this is that insect, like the primary reproductive host. So they would go to these tree and just cover them in egg masses and it, it would be a big mess. So um, yeah, I think that is going to be the primary goal is to, remove tree of heaven if possible to reduce habitat. Any, uh, so. Someone asked any predators for it? I I don't know of any predators, to be honest. Um, I'm not sure if that work has been done. So um, a few years ago when this insect was introduced, um, suddenly there's you know a bunch of researchers working on it. Um, and we have the grad students working on different projects too. So there, there is a lot of research being done um, with this insect, like identifying potential hosts, um, ideal hosts, less ideal hosts that they can still survive on, um, and identifying different control methods. But uh, I, I personally haven't heard anything about their predators yet. Um, I, I'm sure there is some work being done about potential for biocontrol as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, usually it yeah, is. I remember reading an article about them finding bacterium in the soil that would kill these, oh. but... Um, you know, I think that has to be more targeted clearly for it to work, but uh, yeah, well, so that's always everybody's question when it comes to the invasive species is, well, what are their predators? But then they don't realize that, you know, this hasn't been a problem that's been a long problem for scientists. So we're just trying to keep up mm -hmm. with. Yeah. And when we think about different types of biocontrols, um, the classical biological control, like the original method of biological control that was used was, you know, going back to the country of origin for that pest and finding its predator in that location and then bringing that predator back to the new location. Um, because a lot of times when we have these introduced pests, you know, they don't have these predators that they've evolved alongside. 
Um, so that's one, I guess, big drawback to these invasive species is that a lot of times they aren't controlled by local predators. Or, or if they are, we need to do something like biocontrol inundation where we're adding more and more of those predators to help control those populations. Awesome. Okay, well, we're, I'm going to finish it off with one last question because we kind of reached our time. And then this will be a simple one. Cindy asks, where do praying mantis overwinter? Where do, okay, so let's see. They're going to overwinter, I think, in their egg masses. So um, they're going to have um, an egg mass that we actually call an ootheca, and it's going to be kind of an oblong little sausage-shaped thing, um, kind of like a gray cream color. And they're going to lay that on the surface of different types of plants. They might even lay it on a rough surface of brick or something like that. So if you see this kind of almost melted marshmallow looking little mass, um, that might be your praying mantis or otheca where they're overwintering young um, as eggs. Nice. Cool. And Kelly, did I see you comment you're going to have a blog post coming out about that? Yeah, that just, you just, I wrote about finding praying mantis egg cases in your garden. That's going to be my blog tomorrow. Awesome. Um, my blog, yeah, my blog tomorrow. And then I did also share a blog about how much I hate Tree of Heaven. <laughs> Probably should have co-wrote it with Brian, but um, yeah, I am struggling with Tree of Heaven and I want it gone and I, it's all over my neighborhood. So <laughs> even if I eradicate it from my yard, it's not necessarily going to solve my problem. So I, I don't like Tree of Heaven. That might be a fun article to share at like a neighborhood yeah. meeting. We'll get, that, we'll get that in the chat box for everybody for sure. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, don't, we've also got a um, link in the chat box for you there for the horticulture group. So you can ask questions um, in between shows. Um, our next show is going to be November 11th. And our topic that time is going to be apple trees. So keeping with kind of the fall season of apples, we're going to be talking about that. But big thanks to you, Sarah, for being on today. We had a lot of really good questions and I want to th thanks everybody for uh, asking those questions and for joining us today. We appreciate it. Any final thoughts, anybody, before we sign off? Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Have a good, uh, have a great week. Get that vacuum out. And start vacuuming up those <laughs> household insects, and we'll see you uh, next time on November 11th. Thanks everybody. Thank you.